Right, the figure of German individualist and thinker, Max Stirner, a contemporary of Karl Marx, cast a long shadow over the avowed selflessness, selflessness of the global manipulators and their religions of social salvation. Now that the busy social engineers are entering their end game of a new world order for mankind, to which we are all, all of us, expected to eagerly submit. The, war the warnings and wisdom of Max Stirner are more relevant than ever before. Should we allow our values and identities to be determined for us by hidden cliques of hubristic powermongers? Should we? No. Oh, oh yeah. yes. British-based Paul Sullivan will explain to you today why the egoist perspective of Max Stirner is of increasing relevance and offers an alternative perspective of resistance to the modern Leviathan. To speak about the own will of me is the state's destroyer. Please welcome Paul Sullivan. There's always been, already been a few brickbats against the individual and uh, egoism, so-called, uh, today. But I want to sort of say that I'm not really the seventh wheel of the eight-wheel uh, jollopy. Uh, let's start with um, William Blake, uh, a quote from William Blake. And he said, I must create a system or be enslaved by another man's. I will not reason and compare. My business is to create. And that's a one-line speech in itself, basically, by someone who possessed a knowledge of his own will. Uh, so let's flesh it out a bit. Uh, it's said by critics of the modern world that those are the right and the left, that we live in an individualistic culture. Everybody says that. In fact, this so-called individualism, the cry is both a cause and a consequence of the decay of our civilization. Decay? Well, everybody thinks something is wrong. We just tend to differ of what exactly is wrong, and of course, who to blame for it. So pity the poor individualist, you know, because uh, he or, or she gets a bashing from both sides, the court and the crossfire. Uh, well, I'd like to begin by suggesting the opposite, that we live in a strongly anti-individualistic culture, or anti-individualist. So hostile to individualism, in fact, that no one actually knows what it means anymore. I happen to think that anti-individualism is both a cause and a consequence of our decay. And I have come, at Jess's invitation, to put the case for egoism, which we might define as the hypothesis of individualism. Uh, and at least attempt to impress on you how it's relevant, I would say fundamentally so, to our situation. So, so much for the intolerance of right-wing extremists. Um, so, well, many of us here are radicals. I think that can be said. That is, we like to get to the root of things. That's what radical is. Uh, so let's start talking about power again. I respectfully suggest that the social contract uh, is a myth beloved by those educated folk who believe that democracy is a genuine system of representative government rather than the most sophisticated form of social control yet devised. Personally, I think that our present political system is the perfect accompaniment to a society where you can buy 20 grams of washing powder and do exactly the bloody same thing. A society in which planned obsolescence is built in. Nothing works properly because there's no money in that. There's no business opportunities in that. So it's no surprise that our society doesn't work either, is it? When you think about it. You want to, you know, the question of why doesn't our society work properly and the question, why can't I get a light bulb that lasts for a lifetime? These are not separate questions. I would tell you that they're quite actually the same thing. Uh, states, which can basically be defined as systems that seek to secure a monopoly on the use of violence, are founded on conquest. As uh, some wit once said, might is not precisely the same thing as right, but after a few years, no one really knows the difference. Uh, the never-ending flux of power and property suddenly halts, like the music in a game of musical chairs, and whoever happens to find themselves well-seated 
and in the position to lord it over the rest, attempts to make the flux static. Once halted, the Iron Mask descends, on which is written the laws and the codes for the subjects to keep, while the possessors of power are left well established and free to pursue chance and adventure in the flux and creative chaos which has never ceased to exist in that secret order above the state. Which explains the attraction of high finance, a game thus played with limited numbers. So, as the dust settled after the fratricidal carnage of the Second World War, members of that secret order above the state began to broadcast their plans. Uh, James Wahlberg, you may remember, in 1950 told the US Senate, we shall have world government, whether or not we like it. The question is only whether world government will be achieved by consent or by conquest. And only recently, I think it was last week, maybe the week before, I don't know, uh, we heard reverberations of such hubristic posturing by uh, Franz Timmermans, the Vice President of the European Commission, who was kind enough to inform us, I quote, and I can go in the EU chamber now, Diversity is humanity's destiny. There is not going to be, even in the remotest places of this planet, a nation that will not see diversity in its future. That's where humanity is heading. And those politicians trying to sell to their electorates, uh, electorates a society that is exclusively composed of people from one culture are trying to portray a future based on a past that never existed. Therefore, that future will never be. Europe will be diverse, says Franz, like all other parts of the world will be diverse. The only question is, how do we deal with that diversity? And, he concludes, my answer to that is by ensuring that our values determine how we deal with diversity and not giving up our values to refuse diversity. That will bring us down as a society. So, uh, Rather than prod at the uh, totally unwarranted assumptions and slights of mind that are squirming throughout the entirety of Timmerman's speech, which you can read online if you want to, I'm, I suggest you do, uh, we might instead pause to reflect on what well, at least one dissenting voice asked. What are these values that Timmerman refers to as, as for some kind of spiritual reality? At what point in European history did diversity and inclusion become fundamental values? Why must even the remotest parts of this planet be diversified? What's the point of this process? What purpose does it serve? And what is the source of these abstract and undefined values? Uh, now, I don't propose to answer all these questions in detail. I know very well that the majority of this audience, this select audience, would already have formulated their own answers to such perplexing brain teasers. Uh, I propose, if I may, to pro probe a more fundamental question concerning the origins of our values. Now, this subject was one that was of great interest to the man whose quote adorns the title of my talk, uh, Max Stirner. Uh, Stirner was a very casual sort of member of that bunch of tearaways known as the Young Hegelians, uh, a group of intellectual Germans who, in the decade or so after the death in 1831, of Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel uh, reacted to and wrote about his frankly ambiguous legacy. Uh, the young Hegelians drew on his idea that the purpose and promise of history was the total negation of everything restricting freedom and reason. Stirner would occasionally socialize with the Freyan, as they were called, but he held views often contrary uh, to those thinkers, all of whom he consequently satirized and mocked in his nominalist masterpiece Der Einziger und Sein Eigentum, which some of you may well know under its more funky English title, The Ego and Its Own. Uh, one of these so-called left Hegelian firebrands, uh, Ludwig Feuerbach, uh, asserted that religion is a form of alienation in which the believer projects his own desired qualities onto a transcendent divine being. Uh, man, the left Hegelians would say, is not recreated in God's image, uh, let me see. Well, yeah, uh, yes, exactly. Uh, left Hegelians would say it's not. Uh, God is created in man's ideal image. That's what they said. So to overcome this alienation, it would be necessary to reappropriate the human essence, and to realise these God, these ideal godlike qualities are actually man's own, merely the nature of man placed outside of man and conceived 
as external to him. So uh, however in Stirner's view, Feuerbach, by humanizing the divine, had only succeeded in creating a blowback that had mi mystified the human, uh, recreating the supreme being, the spirit that dwells on earth. Stirner asserted that while Feuerbach and the humanists intended to overthrow the domination of thought by theology, what they'd actually done is create a new theology, a new form of alienation. Now the real flesh and blood individual, you know, uh, was a mere vessel in which to contain the hallowed ghosts and spectres derived by modern humanist philosophy and science. So Stirner called the essences fetishized by Feuerbach and his pals as uh, fixed ideas, which is basically any idea that subjected the man to itself. Uh, the, Victoria era, uh, the Victorian era anarchist and feminist, uh, Voltairine de Clare, said, Stirner would have the individual acknowledge nothing, neither science nor logic, nor any other creation of his thought as having authority over him, its creator. And I couldn't really put it better myself. Stirner sought and egoism seeks, ultimately to restore to men and women a consciousness well, a consciousness this, of themselves, their role as creators, by Inziger's, and a renewed appreciation of the full extent of what is, after all, said and done, said and done their property, their eigentum. The unique one, the Einziger, no longer recognizes any law over himself, neither a divine nor a human. He sets his concern on himself alone and sets his uniqueness in opposition to every power. We've been hearing talk about opposition to power uh, all of today. But what the egoist essentially perceives is the fact that he or she is generative. That's the whole point I'm trying to make here. Not merely reactive or responsive. They're the creative source of their ideas and their values. Now, our role as creators is highly significant. Let's start with the basic notion of the unique, so fundamental to the gospel of pious egoists such as myself. Uh, human beings are essentially unique in creation. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. Because we have imagination. Uh, I don't know whether it's a curse or a blessing myself. The rest of the animal kingdom, as the American writer Benjamin de Castro says, uh, sees reality in the raw, without the, without the uh, creative faculty of imagination. Maya's veil, as they call it, is lifted for them. They just see. Uh, but we don't have that existential experience. Uh, we have to create beautiful, inspiring, essentially lies, uh, to exist. We are creators in our very nature. As Nietzsche said, we're greater artists than we realize. Now, before the humanist rage for equalitarianism and leveling, which has decimated our inter intellectual life, there used to be some greater admission that there was such a thing as uh, the human condition, via the some exterior objective reality. So what are, what are some of the features of this condition? Well, primarily, mystery. As seekers, truthers, uh, autodidactic rebels against received opinion, you know, we have a taste for truth, for what is the case. But we have to acknowledge that the fundamentals have always remained you know, hidden behind Maya's veil. Presumably the only mystery for an animal is you know, what's for dinner. But for us, mystery is the very ground of philosophy itself. You can't get past this first principle. Now, some people can't resist trying to F the ineffable, getting their frontal cortexes out, you know, trying to give it one. But the white-coated priests of the new scientism uh, appear to find mystery threatening, uh, presumably because a thing is like mystery in, in existence uh, serves to reveal the arbitrary and finite nature of the new dispensation they would force us to accept. This priesthood, ruled by, ruled by scientists, basically. Uh, this priesthood, despite their appeals to science, and uh, pretensions to objectivity, appear to want the monopoly of power that the church has or that we used to have. So woe betide the heretic who displeases them. For if they stop short of burning him, they will at least attempt to incinerate his reputation in the flame war on the internet. Mm -hmm. Now there it is, mystery, we're stuck with it. Sorry. Uh, so why is anything? Well, to due, res to due respect to those initiates who already know everything, uh, existence is a vacuum of meaning, it's a black hole, which gives the existentialist something to talk about. But don't despair, I have to say, don't despair. What it strongly suggests is that, as artists, and we are 
right, so whether you like it or not, we are fated to invent. We are fated to create our world. We desire to create it. We need to create meaning, significance, gods, goals, inspiring ideas, conceptualizations, all that kind of stuff. And that's what we're talking about today. Imagination, having new ideas. Where are we going? We are, as you can see, profoundly inventive. And I think it's hardly surprising that we characterize God, which I personally regard as a kind of semantic depository for our striving towards the infinite, as a creator. And it's such a central part of our own nature. I'm more interested in semantics than semitics, you might think. Um, not only is the race unique in the so-called animal kingdom, uh, but within the race, each individual is unique. And I remind you, there's no special snowflake emotionalism, you know. Uh, this, you are biologically, whether you like it or not, quite distinct from all other members of the human race. And this includes your mind and consequently your perceptions. But I doubt if I'm speaking to an audience of egalitarians. Uh, Bertrand Russell, in his little red analysis of matter, uh, sums it up by asserting that the only thing we can have any confidence in is our immediate consciousness. We may be wrong about it, possibly, but at least we have some degree of confidence in it. Everything else is an intellectual construction including our conceptions of objects and our theory of the world. Uh, or, as, a, as a Monsieur Bastiot says in the Anarchist Encyclopedia, and yes, there is an Anarchist Encyclopedia, egoism is the tendency to consider everything in relation to oneself. Each one of us has only one brain and uses it as best he can to discover a rule for his conduct. Whatever this rule may be, it is evident that it has its origin in the thinking subject. There's no man outside himself. So what we're talking about really here is the creation of reality, uh, by which I don't mean a phenomena, I mean our interpretation of that phenomena. What does an observation phenomena tell you you should be doing? Can you really tell what you should be doing by looking at phenomena? Well, actually, it doesn't tell you anything. The fact of existence is a mystery. It remains mute on our destiny. Basically, it's up to us, as individuals, to decide what to do, and to do it. This is what the position of self sovereignty really means at its most fundamental. Uh, so let's gaze for a moment on the Janus face of power again. Who is going to create reality? Because, as you know, if you don't create your life, someone will be only too happy to do it for you. If you. Thank you for that. If you, as an individual, I do not accept your fundamental centrality as creator of uh, meaning, significance, and all that kind of thing. The essential mystery doesn't go away. It, uh, the vacuum of meaning remains. And, well, you know how power pours a vacuum. We can't exist in such a vacuum. And so if we don't take on the fundamental responsibility for our values and aspirations, and thus our lives, we will be driven by necessity to accept the values, ideas, and creations of others. I'm trying to get that dynamic of why people buy into other people's values. Hardly need saying, but I'm going to say it anyway. These others do not have their interests at heart. They have only their own interests at heart. No matter how benign or confused, conflicted or emaciated these interests might appear to us, they're bound by their own perceptions, which is inevitable. But why should we be bound by their perceptions? Now, it's a big uh, but, I should say, and it's a big but. We exist, all of us, in a particular social context, and that is in the perennial struggle between two evolving strains, autonomy and authority. Now, in modernity, where a 20th century financial coup d'etat delivered the destiny of the planet into the hands of a network of individuals hidden within the warrens of financial institutions, <coughs> and where cliques of social engineers and intellectuals burrowed to the surface, starry-eyed with the transgressive possibilities afforded by atheism. Well, all the bets are off, we can do what we like. The interests and perspectives we're, in, we're being asked, to, you know, being enjoined to adopt are those of the entrenched powers and domination. Our hungry minds, and they will always be hungry for meaning, are fed the intellectual products of a secular priesthood that ultimately benefit and rule by virtue of our creative inaction and self-enslavement. To employ an archaic phrase, they are the laughing heirs of our self-renunciation. Their, their particular ambitions, their Weltanschung, as they call it, 
leads inevitably to the invention of viral cultural strain that are designed pretty much to sap our <coughs> will. They seep stealthily into our bloodstream via state institutions and the so-called masters of discourse in the media, the academy, the, and the rest of it. Uh, in All Wales 1984, O'Brien tells Winston, you will be hollow, we shall squeeze you empty, and then we will fill you with ourselves. Adding, you are imagining that there is something called human nature which will be outraged by what we do and will turn against us. But we create human nature. Men are infinitely malleable. This is essentially what the political gurus of modernity uh, and their enablers in the field of propaganda and advertising believe. They believe, you know, in capturing the mind, they capture the person. And uh, like victors in any terrestrial war, conflict, whatever, uh, they're secure in the faith that they can then just set about doing what they bloody well like. It's like a campaign of mass mind rape, like the campaign to rape after a war comes to an end. And the uh, ugly progeny of uh, such cognitive violations are everywhere to see. Just look out the window. Uh, so what kind of world do our enemies, yours and mine, envisage? Well, I think we can all agree, wherever we are, that our age is largely defined by an oppressive attempt at a forced and an entirely unnatural homogeneity in the interest of radical social engineering. Hacking wildly at all the tall poppies to level the terrain. There must be no individuals anymore, because no one must be allowed the opportunity to develop unmediated perceptions. We are to be the creatures of the modern state. There is no taming this beast, I say, no bringing it to heel. We have to kill it. Uh, but the state we've inherited, I have to say, is not some concrete edifice like this uh, wonderful building we're in now. Well, monstrosity that you call it. Uh, it's more like a man-eating plant, actually, out of some dystopian science fiction novel, the state. The way to kill it off, you see, is to cut off its source of sustenance which happens to be our own sweat, blood, and tears. Now, the ex-co-chairman uh, of a bank on Wall Street, who I know, Catherine Austin Fitz, called it the tapeworm. It lives by sucking out your very essence. Now, Matt Stirner wrote, states last only so long as there is a ruling will, and this ruling will is looked upon as the tantamount to the own will. The Lord's will is, well, law. What do your laws amount to, though, if no one obeys them? What your orders, if no one lets himself be ordered? The state cannot forbear the claim to determine the individual's will, to speculate and count on this. For the state, it is indispensable that no one have an own will. If one had, the state would have to banish this one. If all had, they would do away with the state. The state is not thinkable without lordship and subjection. He who to hold his own and must count on the absence of will in others is a thing made by these others, as the master is a thing made by the servant. If submissiveness ceased, it would be all over with lordship. So radicals, rebel spirits, some, some might even say traditionalists, um, have often sought to find some solution in our modern woes in party political action, which of course we've heard criticisms of today. But surely many of us now see the futility of this in these kinds of associations, you know, political party ones as I see them, we delegate power. I mean, I guess the whole idea, really. But when someone delegates their power, their willfulness, um, they essentially give it away. And then it's quietly disposed of. Uh, no wonder we're always disappointed, but how can we expect otherwise? Uh, Sterner uh, rejected these kinds of strategies, basically, and uh, in favour of what he termed insurrection. Now, he wrote... Insurrection leads us not, not no longer let our, ourselves be arranged, but to arrange ourselves. It sets no glittering hopes on institutions. It's not a fight against the established, since if it prospers, the established collapses of itself. It's only a working forth of me out of the established. If I leave the established, it's dead. It passes into decay. My object is not the overthrow of an established order, but my elevation above it. Now this distinction Stern makes here between the responsive, essentially passive, instinct of reaction and the generative instinct of creation is uh, crucial. Um, I was just, what I was hearing earlier, I was thinking that, you know, personally, I think the glare of the 
flashes off the hard surface of militant and quite unpopular ideologies, you know, makes people squint and sort of shield their eyes, you know. I think we need to communicate with people uh, by reference to their most deeply held values. In fact, some of these values may be so deeply held that they just don't realize they have them. They may well have disowned them. And we can all think of uh, examples of that. So finally, let's return to that penetrating assertion. The own will of me is the state's destroyer. Sterner's central message is that it's up to us, as individuals, to discover and fight for what and who we are. There are no moral absolutes or ideological reference points outside the reality and values chosen by the individual. Now, Sterner's concepts he has of what he calls ownness and property are oppositional concepts that illuminate the nature of individual autonomy, encouraging individuals to resist values, beliefs, identities that the state society and culture intempt to impose on the population that it attempts to hold in subjection. And it's in this spirit that I uh, recommend him to you. He's, after all, our friend. Uh, Stern closes his book by saying, they say of God, names name thee not. This holds good of me also. No concept expresses me. Nothing that is as designated as my essence exhausts me. They're only names. Likewise, they say of God that he is perfect and he has no calling to strive after perfection. Well, that too holds good of me alone. I am owner of my might, and I am so when I know myself as unique. In the unique one, the owner of himself returns into his creative nothing of which he is born. You know, creative nothing like a black hole where it can't be really penetrated, but everything comes out of it, everything is generated by it. Every higher essence above me, be it God, be it man, weakens the feeling of my uniqueness and pales only before the sun of this consciousness. If I concern myself and myself, the unique one, then my concern rests on this transitory mortal creator who consumes himself. And I may say, all things are nothing to me. Um, the future of power, the heart which beats at the center of this leviathan, depends not on guns, drones, or brute force, but on whether or not those caught in its tentacles discover their own will. So I'm, finally, I'm just saying the key to our liberty, both as individuals and as free unions of egoists, is in our grasping the scepter of our sovereignty. And what is that? It's the, gen uh, it's the scepter of our sovereignty is our generative role as creators, one and all, wielding that power which endows the whole of our lives with meaning. And that's my little talk. Thanks. So, it's up to us to do and to decide what to do. He is an enemy of the global manipulators. He is not a hollow man. He's a firebrand. He's a radical. He's Britain's top expert on Max Sterner and is also on our side. Here's Paulo Solomon. <laughs>